Welcome everyone once again to the Idea Market Podcast, joined with by Mike Elias, the CEO, and we are joined by psychologist sort of extraordinaire, Greg, Hen- Greg Henriquez. And we're going to be talking about uh, the unified theory of knowledge, uh, the unified theory of psychology, and sort of the four principles that, Greg, you've come up with around this, uh, which all have these uh, sort of seemingly complicated names on the on, on the outside, but uh, it all coheres into this sort of True. quite quite a beautiful and extremely radical and I would say brave vision. But before we get into any of that, um, we have a sort of introductory question uh, unique to this podcast, which instead of the tell us a little bit about yourself, we like to ask if you were to design a course, Greg, and the purpose of which is everyone who completes the course becomes a clone of you, what would that course look like? Ah, beautiful. Uh, in fact, I'm outlining such a course. <laughs> uh, it's an it's a entry into the garden. Uh, so essentially behind me is a depiction of the garden, which is captures uh, sort of in weird cartoon, uh, sincere, ironic form, to use a meta-modern term for anybody that knows that, um, a way to organize uh, a number of different pieces. And then you would learn the overall first principles, uh, and then you would enter into it and then learn the parts and then learn to sync up those parts, apply them to yourself and the situation you find yourself in developmentally, historically, in relationship to the future, and then cultivate a new, coherent, integrated, pluralistic set of understanding uh, that turns our chaotic, fragmented pluralism uh, into a way to achieve a lot more harmony and coherent integration for the soul and spirit. So everyone would, would end up the same, but that sameness allows them to become themselves. Right. Definitely not. I mean, you're, you're, each of us is a unique ideographic psyche. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's actually what this little coin represents. It's one, but it's one openness uh, to be the unique, particular, historical, contingent being that you are and no one else. And at the same time, we want to create a dialectic between our uniqueness and, and the particular world in which we occupy and view and the general unifying principles uh, that tie us all together in oneness so that we achieve a oneness, mm-hmm. uh, separateness, dialectic, uh, multiplicity, unity, okay. dialectic. Okay. I have to jump in real quick because I heard a phrase that really piqued my interest in there. Uh, you said ideographic psyche. Mm-hmm. I've heard the term ideographic applied to uh, linguistic things. Like they say Chinese uses ideograms or is ideographic because it has like these visual elements and also that instead of sort of codifying exactly what is meant, it carries with it a weight of context that has a lot of layers and depth to it. I'm interested to know if if your use of ideographic psyche in this sense has some similarities or relations to that. I'd just love for, for you to sure. do like a bit more of exploration on that term. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think there's connection, but if we were in a dictionary, they're using a slightly different term, uh, meaning of it. The, the, Def- dictionary definition that I'm using would be the opposite of nomenthetic. And nomenthetic refers to general laws and principles. Gravity is a great nomenthetic principle about retraction that then is about as generalizable as it gets. Uh, and we can then think about science as delineating generalizable nomenthetic principles uh, that then afford us the capacity to understand from an exterior, if you want to use that view epistemology, oh, what are the laws or habits? of nature that are generalizable and nomenthetic that give, generate causal explanatory frames. Um, in contrast to the nomenthetic is the specific, unique, historical, contingent, ideographic, specific, real, okay? Uh, so in other words, that's the actual uh, event, uh, as it were, with all of its contingent, particular uh, uniqueness. One of the things that's really interesting about psychology, depending on how you look at it, is that you can think about all that unique, particular, specific, unreliable, true to you, but not valid and reliable in any generalizable way from a scientific perspective as error, okay? So if you know science, it's like, oh, well, there's a lot of error, but our laws sort of work because we can count for variance, but then there's this leftover error that has to do with the unique, particular, historical, contingent, ideographic mix of variables that we really can't explain, okay? From the vantage point of me, <laughs> virtually everything that fucking matters in my life is 
error from the vantage point of science, okay? So one of the cool things we got to figure out is what's the relationship between the specific, this is the humanistic scientific debate in psychology, what's the relationship between my specific unique experience of being as an individual, and what are the generalizable realities that say, oh, well, I'm a human primate, that's a, a weird white male that's wandering around with my particular cultural identities and, and doing all of those things at a more generalizable level. And part of the UTOC system is, provides a pretty clear way to place those frames in proper relation. Awesome. Would it, would it be fair to, um, to describe the difference between nomenthetic, which is a word I've never heard before, um, and specific, real, ideographic, unique as uh, the nomenthetic is like the linear, that which can be represented, um, and the specific real is the the nonlinear, the immediate, that every moment and circumstance is, is completely unique in history. You can't step in the same river twice and therefore requires a certain immediate sensitivity that mere adherence to the representable cannot address. Is that kind of the dichotomy? Totally, although I wouldn't use exactly the word linear per se, um, but I would certainly say that all of what you said about the ideographic and then its contrast to what might be the more general quasi-linear, because all science really, certainly you can develop complex adaptive nonlinear scientific frames on the unfolding of causation. In fact, virtually all sophisticated scientific frames are generalizable principles of, especially com, you know, when we get into complex adaptive systems, complexity, chaos theory, all of that tells us, you know, our scientific understanding better include nonlinear dynamic systems from the outside. So I would, uh, I would hesitate to say that That's, those can be very nomenthetic notions. Although we apply the nomenthetic notions to the chaos and complexity, what you realize is your predictability is essentially impossible in terms of outcome. That's what you learn in relationship to that. Uh, in you talk, uh, essentially the way it works is there's the tree of knowledge system, okay, which is the upside down cones of energy starts it and then matter, life, mind, and culture, which is this new map of big history, basically. And then the new map of big history is a vision of the nomenthetic frames of the generalizable causal explanatory unfolding of the wave of causality. So in that system, I am a particular kind of cultured mental living creature that operates on justification and investment and my living organismic history that the scientific lens would see me as an unfolding wave of behavior across those different lenses okay uh, and then you flip that in relationship to this thing called a coin which you can't really see here but basically it's a symbol okay uh it's an i quad coin and what it is is it's really the simplest way to think about it is a mirror for your inner consciousness in its particular moment, okay? So I would look at this and now, oh, this is Greg Henricus with all the unique felt experience of being, the qualitative experiences of being from the first person in the real that science basically obliterates, okay? So scientific knowledge basically decided that first person ideographic contingent quality is not important. <laughs> in fact, you know, I was like, ah, ah, we can't really see it. We can't really map it. And so we're going to map everything around it and then hope that it's just epiphenomenal and doesn't fucking matter. But they actually X'd out the variable and then decided it wouldn't matter, which is kind of unfair. Uh, and it, and it it's, it's ideographic. The, uh, the, the, it, the, uh, it, the, the judgment call is an, is an ideographic unique phenomenon. a bunch phenomenon. of ideographic people getting together saying, we don't fucking want this ideographic <laughs> variable. So yeah, man, exactly. you, don't, you don't want to do that. You got to get that variable back in there. And you have to understand that you factored it out first, contextualize it, and then put it back in. And that's what people couldn't figure out how to do. Um, so the humanists in psychology said, fuck you, you guys, you, you guys X'd it out. It's not fair. It's clearly real. We have to attend it. The you know natural science psychologist said, ah, oh, we'll figure it out, or you have to do all this and blah blah blah. And the science humanistic split, you know, there's no system that afforded us the capacity to get to psyche and behavior in proper relation. Uh, you talk is uh, about doing that in part. Awesome, and I can't I can't wait to to go more into that, but I just I want to jam a little bit more on this distinction because I think it's one that'll be familiar to people. Um, from other contexts, mm -hmm. like when when we're talking about this distinction, um, I'm I'm most recently reminded now of the, I guess sort of Taoist distinction between masculine and feminine. You have okay. masculine frame structure, mm -hmm. 
emptiness, timelessness, and then you have feminine, perpetual change, variety, uh, form, Mm -hmm. you know, form versus function. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these divisions have this same kind of entanglement that you just, you know, described. So I'm just, I'm just trying to help, help people who might have more of that background, um, use it to link into your, your frameworks here. So I just think that's really cool that um, you've synthesized all this in a new way. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, uh, I love that, love that reference. Um, we definitely need, uh, to shift from some of our Western dichotomized thinking, especially dichotomized thinking that's like broken dichotomies that we can't get put back together. Most common mind body kinds of problems. Okay. Um, and dialectical thinking that puts certain kinds of polar energies in proper relation, uh, and perspectival positions in proper relation and recognize that it's, it's this and this, and it's the whole world in relation that affords the proper framing. And we just haven't figured out how to do that. And really with the enlightenment, when they built um, sort of objectivist third person science for matter in motion, one of the things they set in motion is this matter mind dichotomy or mind body problem dichotomy that, that, that we just haven't been figuring out how to you know, recognize and undo and redo so that we get the proper uh, well positions in relation of psyche and physics as it so, were. Or so Greg, when I was, um... One thing I do really want to bring in because it just fascinated me when you were talking about it, when I was doing the research for this, watching a few of your talks and, and read, your, read your book. Um, one of, as I was reading it, I was getting the, the same feeling I get, well, you used to get when I read Jung, right? So it's all of this very, it's often quite structured, but then you, you have this feeling of like, there's, there's something a bit more mystical or something a bit more strange behind all this. And then I watch your talks and I'd, I know you've spoken about this a few more times on other podcasts, but I would like for you to to perhaps tell if if you if you want to how you came across this theory because it's not exactly how you know it's not like you sat down one day and just edged out something uh you called it sort of the uh the event or something something along those lines <laughs> <laughs> well right there there was a, there was the tok flash uh the tr- tree of knowledge flash uh that really basically launched me into a fucking totally weird dimension of understanding uh, that happened in so Essentially, the story is this. Uh, in a nutshell, I happen to go whatever detail. Uh, but I, anybody that's followed me knows I tell it a couple of times. Anyway, I'm hey, I'm trained as a regular behavioral scientist psychologist. Okay, when you get trained as a behavioral scientific psychologist, you say, oh, everyone's out there doing folk psychology. Hey, that's what you do when you deal with your wife and your problems and blah blah blah, and you get all neurotic and you make sense out of shit and you're this and that and blah blah blah. And then we built this thing called science, which is a particular method. And then the science has real critical questions that we can get to truth through the methods of science. And then I learned all the behavioral methods of science, which are super important. And then you apply them to psychology and you're supposed to exact, extract these general truths. And I bought that that's what psychology did. And, but I also want to become a clinician. So then I go and I do psychotherapy, okay? Start learning psychotherapy. And then when you're actually individually with a real person in a real context, all that shit that you read studies about feels pretty fucking distant, you know? It's like, hmm. And then you watch all the best of the best from the various approaches. They get really good outcomes, and the shitty people from the, shitty, from the same approaches get lousy outcomes. You actually learn the science is really they all basically get the same outcomes, minus a few. CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is out there trying to promote, but it's basically just propaganda, trying to promote, oh, this is the way to get the truth. And uh, it turns out that's bullshit. And so then you're like, actually, there's all these key insights that are, if you know Wilbur at all, Ken Wilbur, it's like a partial and truth position, okay? And then I'm like, why are we doing these different schools of thought like CBT, psychodynamic, family systems? Why don't we take the science of human psychology and apply it and organize the field that way? Shouldn't, that's what medicine sort of does, okay? Well, this gets me into what's called the problem first of psychotherapy and then the problem of psychology. Like, what the fuck is psychology? And that's when I realized, oh my God, we actually don't know that at all. And that's an amazing thing that people should know that we have no idea what the word psychology means. In fact, I will tell do you. Do you have I'm, a Do you have a provisional idea? Like, oh, what's, yeah, what's your what opinion on? Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly oh, what it means. Oh, now, thank goodness. But, so, but but you should. Everyone on this podcast should know that psychology got started. It grew into lots of different things, and by the 1920s, folks, that's a hundred effing years from now ago. Everyone agreed that we didn't know what it meant. And we would then decided that we would never know what it meant. The field is in complete agreement that it doesn't know what it means and is in complete agreement that it can never know what it means. They don't teach you that. 
but I can show you as a scholar that that's exactly the case. It's actually called the crisis in psychology, historically. It's the fact that there are all these different reference that nobody agrees, and there's no way to put them together, and you come to the conclusion that you never can. And then what they do is they will solve the problem through methodological science rather than knowledge. So we're going to apply the methods of science. That's why, by the way, it's the science of behavior and mental process. Behavior is pulled out methodologically by the science, and then everybody gets the bullshit about what they mean by mental process. And then it all depends on your mid-level model. And so they built a proliferation of mid-level models of really interesting shit, all of which are contingently defined by an ideographic fucking researcher <laughs> that can't be nomenthetically put together as they're arguing they're doing a nomenthetic game. I mean, it's unfucking believable when you actually get inside of it. It's a complete mind fuck. Okay. And so there's a thing called a problem of psychology. It's a crisis. Nobody knows. It's way more important than quantum gravity. Okay. It's way more important than quantum gravity. And, no, and we've known about it for 100 years and nobody cares. Drives me insane. I mean, it's like I live in, I wake up every day in Alice in Wonderland. It's like, everyone knows this. It's super important and no one cares. Okay. It's bizarre, you know. But anyway, I found out about it. I backed into it because I had to do psychotherapy. I want to do it from a scientific perspective. You don't do that based on studies. You basically do that on understanding. A nomenthetic, generalizable understanding of human mental behavior is what we want so that I can use a general nomenthetic understanding and place the unique ideographic psyche, who I'm treating, in psychological doctor terms with a generalized understanding and then create the proper relation between my scientific generalized understanding and the ideographic psyche. That's what I wanted, and there's nothing like that. Well, until I built it, okay? So anyway, I drop into this, get the problem of psychotherapy, stumble into the problem of psychology. I didn't really even know how, this is 1996. So, and I'm building this, I go drop into what's called evolutionary psychology, okay? Because actually cut connects you to biology and then that connects you to chemistry and physics and you get into the natural sciences. And that is, by the way, I believe psychology to be coherent has to be coherently anchored to the natural sciences, okay? But this is the big problem. How do you get from natural science to a psyche, ideographic, subjective, conscious experience? No one can do that. So anyway, I have, the, I have one key insight, which is the first thing that launched me. It's called justification systems theory. And it's the short version of it is, is Hey, we are primates at one point, a lot like the rest of the great apes. And over first a 500,000 to then a 50,000 year period, we go from great ape like behavior for really 5 million years into hunter gatherers that are really synced up with each other. And then all of a sudden we fucking start talking and then we build culture. Okay. And then over the last 50,000 culture, our justification systems is the technical term and our technology totally explode. And then we behave like no other animal on earth. Okay, over the last 50,000 to 100,000 years. Well, I figured out, I landed on an idea that the core of the ideological structure is this thing called the problem of justification, which happens with propositional language. And then you start talking, and then you ask question answer dynamics, and question answer dynamics give rise to called the problem of justification. And that then drives the evolution of an ego, a persona, and a culture, which is like, hey, I got to justify to myself, I got to justify to you, and we all got to collectively get together and decide what is and ought is on the propositional language. And then actually, culture explodes out of primate world through this emergence, capital C culture. And then we build technologies because our collective intelligence grows tremendously. And then that builds on itself, and boom, you get the explosion. So I saw that in 1996, okay, late 1996, changed my, I'm all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my God, I'm a justifying ape. <laughs> That's what I am. You know, it's not opposable thumbs or even reason. It's our collective capacity to come together and justify, justify ourselves to ourselves, selves to each other, and collectively each other in relationship to the world. All right. That was going to be my life. So I was like, oh my God, I figured this thing out. It's unbelievably important, blah, blah, blah. And then one night, I'm stoned in 1997, okay? I'm just like, and because I developed what now becomes joint points, so I developed a joint point, a, that's a causal explanatory framework that took me from a primate to a culture person plane of existence. And then I could see clearly, I differentiated technology, and I could see the collective cultural ideological evolution of these networks, the social construction of knowledge is what it's a theory of, okay? It's like, why do we get together and construct knowledge and how? And it's like, okay, I've got this separation, I've got the if you want to do it in scientific terms, I have a variance accounted for, okay, in relationship to the generalized human relative to the rest of the animal kingdom. And I'm now networking that out. All right. So I'm stoned one day and I'm like, well, okay, well, how do we get there? And I have the original drawing and I basically draw a circle for Big Bang. And then I was like, well, there's one cone, there's one cone, one other cone. That one cone comes matter. So matter pops out of energy and the cone 
was upside down cone, drew that, and then, oh, life pops out of matter, and then animal mind pops out of life, and then persons pop out of animal mind, okay? Well, I fucking drew that thing out and was like, boom, my life changed. This is unbelievable. I saw those cones and every bit of my cells, which that's why I kept the damn drawing. It's like, oh my God, that's like a map of everything <laughs> right there. It organ it's five different sets of variants that I now can actually conceptually organize. Energy, energy, really I call it the energy information implicate order technically, but it's just call it energy. And then matter comes out of that and life comes out of that and mind, animal mind, we get that all screwed. It's animal mind comes out of that and culture persons come out of that. And guess what? Science is a form of cultural justification that circles back and maps the whole goddamn thing. All right. So now I had this unbelievably simple map, okay, of the universe that actually made sense and put energy and matter in relationship to psyche and then science all in a coherent picture. And to, to talk about a mind fuck, I was then like, oh my God, I found out this formula. Okay, it's unbelievable. And the early diagrams I have, I kept from everybody and I have little things on there that says, please do not use and reproduce without permission. Because the phenomenological experience of me was I was like looking at a car outside. It wasn't complicated. My phenomenological experience, I just looked at this map and I'm like, oh my God, this is a map of the universe. And nobody else has had this. And I just figured it out in a stone weird night in August of 1997. And then I was like, I wouldn't, anyone actually sees this. They could actually steal this thing. <laughs> You know, so I hit it. I mean, literally for a year, I fucking hit the thing thinking that other people. And then I was like, I tried to contact, you know, the leading thinkers at Harvard, you know, Steve Pinker and E.O. Wilson. And E.O. Wilson produced Consilience. And I'm like tapping on Dan Dannett. Like, guys, guys, a little postdoc over here. Or not even, I was a doc student at the time. I was like, oh, I figured this shit out. Guess what? They're like, oh, you know, Dan Dannett wrote back one word to my little email. It's like, unsurprising. <laughs> like, yeah, right, Dan. Anyway. Whatever, then I realized I couldn't give the goddamn thing away. And that was a weird thing, it was a weird thing. You know, you realize you actually, and the institutional structure and its own embeddedness was essentially fundamentally already blind to the potential insight. And then it was already justified that why this was either common sense that everybody already knew or some crazy set of ideas that couldn't be true. And so everybody just short circuited at the institutional level as to whether it was that. And I just kept going and I was like, fuck this, I know what this is. Um, I'm just going to keep pursuing this and my soul and spirit ultimately comes along and, you know, goes, builds this tree of knowledge as obviously a lot of symbolism there and ultimately finds its way back to a garden and a tree of life uh, and finds redemption in relationship to how to actually, you know, follow this path. Perhaps, perhaps this isn't something you always focus on in your talks, but I'm interested to, as you say, there's the two sides there of the institution, like either this is common sense or it's crazy, in which case they're ignored, right? Because if it's common sense, we all know it, don't bother with it. If it's crazy, it's crazy, don't bother with it. What sort of, what did you have to do from there on to to, to get it into the institution? Like, did you, what, have you almost like developed a technique to get, you know, under unknown, what you'd consider facts or unknown theories into something which is built in such a way as to just ignore them? Yeah, well, it's really fascinating. I mean, so, I mean, I, I'm a, my, both my parents, my, my dad's a professor, my mom's an adjunct professor. Uh, I spent my entire time in the academy. So I'm, an, I'm a total academic insider. I'm at the University of Vermont, at the University of Virginia for my pre-doc. I go to the University of Pennsylvania. And then I go from here to a professorship here at James Madison, which is actually where my undergraduate is. So I'm born and bred, not upper tier Harvard, okay, although I hang out with those people, but I'm, but I'm, I'm on the outside of but just one echelon down. University of Pennsylvania is pretty close. Anyway, uh, the bottom line is, is that, so I'm under the impression that the academy gives a shit about truth. I mean, it was naive, you know, but, you know, I was under that impression, even though I was socialized. They told me that. They told me they cared about that. And they told me, if you follow the reasonable steps of publication and, and architecture, Unlike somebody like Wilbur, I could look at Wilbur and like, ah, he went to all of our, he's not a serious academic. You know, you publish your fucking books, get a bunch of people following you. But if you sit in the core and the epicenter, uh, you know, I work with Aaron T. Beck, the father of cognitive therapy. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm running studies. I'm making connections with people. And I tell the inside people, I have this theory. Okay. And then I publish in the Review of General Psychology in 2003. That's when I come up with so after I build the thing, it takes me a long time. Actually, first off, what, you know, what I do is I actually go into physics. I spent basically four years conceptually learning all of physics. That I, I don't do math. 
but I needed to learn string theory. I need to learn loop counter gravity. I need to learn black hole thermodynamics. I need to learn all that shit. No standard theory of elementary particle physics ups and down conceptually. Um, and the reason was because this thing is a networked structure and I needed to understand the energy information networking that happens both at Big Bang and quantum field theory so that I could be grounded in the kinds of evolutionary stuff that happens with matter. Anyway, the point of it is that then once I had done that, I then grew into biology, understood cell theory, understood genetics, understood really evolution, understood the classic modern synthesis, its weaknesses in relationship to a whole bunch of other things I don't need to get into. And then I fundamentally under understand, uh, you know, mind behavior, uh, cognition structures around the animal world. And I actually had to digest Skinner. Skinner was actually the hardest fucking person for me to digest. Really interesting. Finally digested Skinner and was in 2001 and, and developed a thing that would become behavioral investment theory. Okay. Uh, which was actually the last of the four pieces uh, that make up the unified theories, tree of knowledge, justification systems, the influence matrix was the fourth key idea. Behavioral investment theory was the last piece, in some ways the most commonsensical, but it was the piece that afforded me the bridge between cognitive science, neuroscience, evolutionary theory, and Skinnerian radical behaviorism, which is actually it connects to Skinner's key insights, but it doesn't buy as epistemology. Anyway, as maybe a lot, maybe too much here, but this, to get to the bottom point, I then solved the problem then of Skinner, because I had solved the problem of Freud with justification. And then I could show that the tree of knowledge said that Skinner dealt with this joint point, okay, between life to mind, and then Freud's fundamental insight was between mind and culture. And then I could build a unified approach that took Skinner's core insights, Freud's core insight, and stuck it on a physical, biological, animal psychological, human psychological, societal, into science picture that was undeniably coherent. And then I published that in the Division I journal, Review of General Psychology in 2003. And when I got that accepted, I was like, I'm done. You know, you, you publish these things and then, all right, in a real journal, the, the, you know, it's a, a good impact factor. And I was like, holy shit, all right, I'm going to, e emails are going to flood in. You know, I got three fucking emails from the goddamn pr pr thing. It was unbelievable. Nobody cared. <laughs> um, so, so the, and the reason I didn't know this at the time is that academic institutional knowledge is fundamentally not just about truth claims. They're truth claims embedded in a justification system in the proper zone of proximal development where the institution has already decided this is an answer they care about, okay? So for example, when the DNA finding happened, all right, Watson, Crick, Roslin, all those people, when they all got together, everyone was looking for the double helix and they knew it was gonna be unbelievably important. So you had this massive technological race of all the big name people that were all on the edge of their seats wondering who's gonna win and the crystallized analysis of the particular molecular structures pop and boom, you get, oh my God, there's a race, we get to it. And you do four fucking pages and the whole thing blows up, right? Okay. Uh, but if no ever, if the institution already decided that this is an unanswerable question and already overcommitted to an epistemological, methodological approach of research to publish something that has no data on it. And it's this meta theory that no one else in the institution has any basic frame of reference for even judging. It sits there, you publish it, and everyone's looking at it. That's a really interesting paper from all these different angles, but there's no institutional momentum to leverage anything. And so it just sits there in the abyss. Okay. I ended up getting lucky. I then published two special issues in the Journal of Clinical Psychology and then brought a bunch of people together that are main people Dave Geary, Keith Stanovich. Uh, Paul Gilbert. I mean, these are major people in the field that comment on the thing. Still, though, the, the ideas were so far away from the institutional contingencies and status and would actually require a complete rewriting of the way we did shit if they actually believed in them. The problem is the ideas themselves then ground against the institutional structure. So everyone just sort of looks at them as like, well, now what the hell are you going to do? You actually have to back up all your influence and investment patterns and then reboot them because this thing has told you you've actually took a long turn a hundred fucking years ago, and now you have to reestablish the way the entire structure is built. And all the, all the pinkers of the world, I mean, not like I have any specific gripe with him, but all the pinkers in the world, I mean, who's gonna stop their full professorship at Harvard and be like, okay, actually everybody, time for a reboot. You know, nobody's gonna do that, you know? Uh, so then I realized that actually around the time is actually, this isn't about the academics, it's about the children. 
you got to build a garden and build a preschool around a garden and then get the kids all socialized in and look to 2050 on this thing, the back half of the 21st century, rather than trying to convince the institutional structures. I mean, this is a late down uh, realization, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But ultimately, the structure was so far, the ideological structure of the unified theory is so far away from the contingent and expected conventional structure of the way the academic institution in general and psychology is built. Is it just is a dead on arrival, essentially, in relationship to its capacity to make an influence? Yeah, and I love the phrase uh, behavior investment theory. I would love to hear more about that because it sounds like it's very tied into this dynamic that you're talking about, where when you present an idea that has the power to reframe or reconstitute an entire institution, what you're really doing is asking it to pay a gigantic cost. Okay. And unless there's the appearance of a of a equivalent benefit, you know, they're really dealing with an economic question. Are we willing to take this giant risk? Does it really seem like it's going to be worth it? And so truth is, uh, the pursuit of truth is kind of subject to our ability to reconcile it with the psychoeconomics, even on, on an individual level or on an institutional level. And uh, I just, I just love to hear more about that. Of course. Yeah. So behavioral investment theory is you picked up on the first key principle is a principle of energy economics, okay? Uh, so it's got a set of different principles. Uh, the overarching picture is basically this. Uh, you get organisms with their genes and their cells and their organ systems growing, reproducing, living, and engaged as complex adaptive systems, okay? But they're, they're bound in relationship to their movement to either reproduction, individual cell movement, or slow collective multicellular movement hang out with a vine, okay? It's not a lot of fun, all right? Uh, they move, if you speed up the tape, you can see, oh my God, that vine just sort of ate that tree, okay? But you gotta be there for like 25 years, all right? Um, so they don't move in anywhere. Well, then what nature developed is there's this whole other orthogonal dimension of complex adaptive behavior that if you have a nervous system and a muscular system and a segmented body around it, you get that plant-like thing up and you start moving it around, <laughs> Okay, and that's amazing. And so your whole neuromuscular structure with a centralized control system at the brain and the segmented body, all right, is about moving fundamentally, okay, as a singular functional whole. Now, how do you, how, if you're nature, what fundamentally are you gonna organize the movement around? Okay, and the answer basically- Reproducing is, without permission. <laughs> right, that's certainly true, and surviving. So survival and reproduction, but now it's basically, and that's the bio, but that's still the biological metabolic structure overall. So the embodiment is trying to do that. But now you basically have to do the, the nervous system as an engineer, it takes a lot of calories on top of that to do what? You're gonna have to move the system toward the good and away from the bad relative to costs, okay, fundamentally. So essentially what you have to do is the work effort that takes to metabolize the brain, to organize the system and then to move it, okay, is the fundamental key. I'll give you an example. There's a little thing called a sea squirt, okay? It's an unusual little creature early in the world, okay? A little sea squirt and it's got a little brain and it gets reproduced as, a, as an animal. And then its job is to find a good location for itself, okay? So it swims around and is hunting for a particular place to land. And then when it lands, it attaches and then it basically translates into a plant because it now fits there. You know what it does with its brain when it's located there? It eats it, okay? Because it no longer needs a brain, all right? Because it's now it's just dead calories. So what the brain fundamentally is about doing is about coordinating the behavior of the animal as a whole, okay? Toward the good, in essence, away from the bad, relative to cost opportunity functions, risk cost opportunity functions. So fundamentally, it's an energy economic system, work effort, relative to time, relative to cost, relative to opportunities, that's constantly making predictions about the paths of behavioral investment. You know, I'm gonna spend my energy here. If you know John Verbeke at all, you know recursive relevance realization. Well, that's the cognitive structure is determining a particular space of what's relevant to then realize what you can predict and then realize what you can accomplish. And that is the process by which the cognitive system builds paths of behavioral investment. And I just recognize the basic architecture of a path of behavioral investment, which is a work effort path 
to achieve a particular outcome relative to risk, relative to other possible paths. So you can almost think of yourself like a, a, you know, like a quantum particle. Essentially what the brain does is it creates a multiple path analysis, calculates path of least effort resistance, and then engages in a particular effort to realize those particular outcomes. That's the core of the nervous system organization. And behavioral investment theory says, hey, if you do that, you take neuroscience and its fundamentals like Carl Friston and predictive processing active inference. You take B.F. Skinner and the way the behavior of the animal as a whole and the environment takes it. You take people like John Berbeke and you get recursive relevance realization. You tie them all together, put it on an evolutionary foundation, the Cambrian explosion. And then you have a mind brain behavior synthesis that affords you clarity about the complex adaptive processes by which these systems navigate the agent arena relation. Perfect. Perfect. I have two, two things to comment on. One, I'm a big uh, Wilhelm Reich fan and he talks about ah. the psycho, the sex economic, you know, sure. systems a lot. Totally. Like that's where that's, that's my entry into this okay. metaphor. Yeah. Um, also I have a complaint and I wonder if you share it. The uh, there's been a lot of hype in the last, I don't know, 70 years or so about game theory and mm -hmm. about, you know, these economic predictions of rational actors. Sure. And then that hype was, you know, disappointed as it turned out that people, quote, didn't actually pursue their best interest. Right. But it seems to me like they merely didn't include the psychoeconomic calculations in those that we are really rational actors, but we don't know what we want. In fact, we kind of can't to a certain extent. So, right. So, uh, right. The, the rational economic man, I mean, serious people never always knew that was the fallacy. Um, but nonetheless, if you apply it in general populations as economic actors, you can get a general nomenthetic principle that makes a lot of fucking good predictions. Okay. And then the question is, what do you mean by rational? Okay. And certainly I'll tell you what we know you don't mean is we do not mean an analytic money calculator. Okay. That sits in a pure knowing system and says, I'm going to maximize my $10 relative to $10 I spend or lose. And everything will be according to that. And, you know, just basic similars like, oh, my God, I'm going to go buy this pair of pants. If I know it's $30 and then I realize down the road I can get it for 15, will I walk down the road and get it for 15? Fuck yeah. OK, but if I'm going to go buy a car and it's $20,000 and it's $15 cheaper down the road, it's $20,000. Fuck it, it's 15 bucks. I don't give a crap. It's $15 for walking down the road. OK, but no, that's not the way we think. OK. So we know that there's a huge numbers of ways in which we calculate econ you know, monetary economics. And then they basically said, okay, we're going to do computational algorithms on maximizing this in this space. And you're exactly right. In fact, I have a blog, okay? Behavioral investment theory is the missing link in economics, okay? You don't drop the energy economic system into a justified rational algorithmic system. Although if you do it generalizably, a bunch of bad actors, you do get, I mean, a bunch of actors, you'll get an invisible hand effect, okay? So you can make calculations nomenthetically about it, but you can also see people violate that all the time. And underneath what you have is a justifying system that's trying to satisfy some context. In addition to a whole host of context, it's sitting on a behavioral investment primate system that goes all the way into an animal organism system. And the calculus of those energy economic processes are not maximizing your dollar bottom line by any stretch, okay? So you're going to maximize a certain kind of utility, and you better be clear about the utility that the system is attempting to maximize. And behavioral investment theory clarifies the foundational utility uh, energy investments that are actually operating. And if you don't have that, you're going to miss the entire economic bubble at the level of trying to hyper-rationalize it. Yeah, yeah, I'm super into this. And the, um... oh. Well, something you just said about how it how it all kind of plugs down into the animal, the biological economic systems as well. Since your uh, your framework is intended to be holistic and in, in terms of like map of the universe, the whole thing, all the all the levels of study, all the levels of you know materialization, I've, it makes me kind of wonder if this leads all the way down to a you know physics is economical. Uh, sub quantum physics is economical that maybe in a way this could this aligns with uh, Leibniz's idea of we live in the best possible world because the universe is incredibly economic like that's the fundamental feature of it yeah the, the, go check out the principle of, of least action okay and there's a thing called principle of least action uh, and essentially like if you a photon what is the path that a photon takes from A to B 
Uh, and it's organized, although there's all the quantum possibilities, uh, actually you ask some over the possibilities and what you see is the principle of least action, okay? And so you can, and behavioral investment theory is the principle of least effort, which is similar, but actually it's a calculating thing. But you can go all the way into physics and this gets into energy, entropy, relations, definitely. And a foundational principle, whether the only, certainly I argue it's the only foundational principle, but the principle of least action is an, un, there, I could, two or three videos that are brilliantly articulate just why this principle, see, it goes into quantum theory, it goes into general relativity, it goes into thermodynamics. Uh, yeah, you, you know, energy economic concepts actually are really deep in the stack, really deep in the stack. So I totally appreciate that intuition. That's awesome. That, that's really exciting. I had already been thinking about Leibniz because of the monadology and the idea that everything is the same at all scales and at different scales and, and right. things like that. So all and, the things you were telling me about that were you know, resonating there. Um, yeah. But also people have been occasionally you know, objecting to idea market, what we're building. Uh, how, mu how much do you know about, uh, about idea market and the, and the basic premises? Not much. I, okay. I, I dropped myself into one particular theory and mine that as much as possible. It's hard for me to pay attention to the rest of the world. <laughs> no, I 100,000% am the same way, but in my particular little nerdy project. So uh, idea market is a method of uh, valuing information using markets. If the world has to decide what to pay attention to and has limited attention or many choices to make, we use markets to allocate between um, you know, scarce resources between parties with conflicting interests for every other asset class. Why not information? Why not attention? That's, that's the basic idea. And we often get this objection like, aren't, uh, isn't truth and money or information and money, aren't they like fundamentally different things? Isn't money like kind of corrupt and it has its own incentives and stuff like that? And what I'm starting to feel more and more comfortable saying is, no, they're really like the same thing. And or money is an abstraction of, of attention. They're both mm -hmm. scarce resources that we're constantly investing and justifying and risk managing. And the, the closer we get to the metaphor, the better things will work, not the worse. I, I really appreciate that. I mean, money is a symbol of potential energy and then, and then the ways in which people are gonna hold that collective potential energy and then distribute it and turn it into kinetic energy as they buy, right? Um, is is an unbelievably powerful force and we definitely want to align i mean the key is how do we align our economic incentives to create market forces that actually then feed back on shit we actually should be eating and relating to and experiencing as opposed to twinkies you know and killing the coral reefs you know i mean that's a, the, the, so the issue is to me the issue is yes there's an enormous pragmatic force function in relationship to potential kinetic market energy if you can align the proper, you know, and then how and who's control and what interest and all that other shit, and I'm no economic, uh, economist by any stretch, uh, but fundamentally that proper relation is absolutely essential. And if we're going to actually evolve into this, what I call this new weird digital age structure, uh, part of the evolution of money uh, and attention and ideas and all of this will ideally be a more coherent and complementary relation. Uh, I certainly don't think it's guaranteed, and there are a lot of in indications that they can. I mean, look what happened to the academy. You know, I mean, my, in, my, in psychology, it then because of its institutional investments, it gets in the wrong class, and now it's got sunk cost investment on a particular structure, and then you get people in power that need to maintain a sunk cost investment because their own status is built on it, and you know, it's certainly a system get corrupt. Yeah, certainly. I just think it, it aligns really well with your, you know, the behavior investment theory. This is kind of a belief investment theory or an attention yep. investment theory. Right. And well, uh, yeah. So, right. And so what we really do want, I mean, there are, there are idea, ideas, you have perceptual reasoning ideas. These are your pictorial network ideas that are gestalt based. They are going into your, what could be called perspectival knowing uh, and other kinds of procedural knowledge, technological stuff, which turns skill and other things, recipes into power. Um, but Yet, in terms of raw ideas, the theoretical ideas, the schematic semantic structures of understanding, fuck, man, we can get there. I mean, my whole point is, why aren't we, this is where me and the problem of psychology sort of intersects, is like, how would we get the attentional system to be aware of a common sense reality that this is a giant problem that we actually should care about? And if you actually had somebody that could solve it, we actually would care about that. I don't know how to make that attentional work, but it seems like it's ABC to me. <laughs> But maybe you guys can figure out yeah. why uh, that nobody well, gives that, a shit about it. But. 
No, that's that's exactly one of the things that that inspired me to to do something that became this, yeah. which is the 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 gap between the world's best information and common knowledge is so huge. And we have the internet now, so it's not an access problem. There's a there's there's a curiosity problem or yeah. a, uh, a a sunk cost problem. There's all these sort of in, inertia type problems that have nothing to do with access. So we have discoveries that would change civilization more than the printing press, just ba sitting on the proverbial table or in our pockets. Totally. And we're just not picking it up. Like that's we're one physical gesture away from revolutionizing what it means to be a human being in a, in a lot of ways. I totally and approve of that. So what I'm what I'm hoping, you know, having a market incentive will do is kind of pay people to be curious, to check out mm. those disruptions, because that's where the profit is in every other market. If you look mm. at startups, if you look at stocks, mm -hmm. the the all the money is made by VCs who look at what's, you know, what's the unlikely but high impact thing. Yep. And how can I get there before everyone else? Right. And if we can enrich people for doing that for information, yep. then there will be a whole lot more attention on discovering and growing those high impact knowledge pieces that we have no structure for right now. Dude, you know, that guy. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> As somebody fucking found a little rabbit hole and built a unified theory of knowledge and now looking around going, you know, living here in Stewart's draft going, hey, does anybody care about this? You know, it's like people are like, what? But if we could, you could fill an ecology, uh, you know, and structure a contingency system that actually would cultivate the capacity of that process to get positive feedback on the investment. Well, Jesus, you know, that'd be beautiful. I love it. Yeah, we're, we, are, we are hacking on that, man. We want to, we're basically trying to use you know, behavior investment theory and this this idea that even even Taleb, probably one of the most respected economists today, he says rationality is risk management. Mm -hmm. Man, those four words, like we could take those incredibly seriously and I think get uh, a, some serious, you know, revolution type activity out of it. Totally. Just 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 to be able to, you know, change the incentive landscape of of curiosity. Now that we have the knowledge, we need you know, the incentives and the environment that supports people who take advantage of that knowledge instead of shunning them. Right. Right. There's sort of, there's sort of a paradox there, though. I mean, in terms of if to look at this once again, psychologically, which is that, uh, in, uh, you know, this is quite what I'm going to say is quite rough. But in terms of, you know, the psychology, it's like people who are trying to heal themselves might be stuck in a loop of doing the same thing. What is it that is stopping them in terms of your theory of making that rational leap to say, well, you know, we've been doing X a thousand times and we're still miserable. Mm -hmm. Why don't we look at Y, which is, you know, undervalued or underrated or hidden away? Why did why why is that leap from common knowledge, which is making you repeatedly depressed, anxious, whatever, never made mm -hmm. sure. to the the smaller thing? Sure. Um well, I'll speak. For, uh, why don't I just situate my reply? I can go a lot of different ways. I can go as a clinician in relationship to that, but I'll just situate. I know and I have a much better understanding with regards to at least my my own theory as to why it's a nightmare in in terms of trying to get change in the short term. Uh, and that is because it's this unbelievably complex cathedral uh, architecture. And I was I was focused simply on getting the cathedral right in inside of it and not thinking at all about a sort of a marketing thing that would make it accessible for whatever populace might be interested in digesting it and using it so that it's in the zone of proximal investment where you're actually like oh i know actually how to use this and then i can use it in a cumulative way um, people if you're in a particular loop or and just in general people are looking for things in the short term generally that they can then operate on and demonstrate benefit from okay the way I built this system, although I'm super excited about it from the inside, if you try to get at it from the outside, and especially when I built it originally, um, it was so far away and so focused on a particular type of angle of precision and clarity of logic that doesn't that didn't fit with the leveraging of what people sort of wanted. And then to try to actually trail yourself to it, grab a hold of it from sort of the outside. And I have a particular gift that can see it. Many people don't. So it's very kind of clunky and confusing. And, and so you get this clunky, confusing, very complicated thing. And I say it's like learning a language. Like, you know, people are like, 
people come to me like, you know, I spent a weekend looking at your stuff. I'm not sure I understand your theory. You know? It's like, uh, it's like understanding French people. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, I went to a weekend workshop on French and I didn't speak it at all before. And I, I don't know that I fully am fluent in French. It's like, yeah, you're not fully fluent in, you talk, uh, you spend a weekend with it. Um, so I, so my, I have devoted my first part of my life then to build the thing, because that's what I'm gifted at. I, I can do that. I have a high level, uh, you know, theory capacity and can then put shit together that other people can see. My task now is where the theory is pretty, I, well, we'll see, but it feels tight. Okay. It feels like, all right, I built the cathedral. I'm hopeful that there'll be grounds that grow off of it still. I love the creative process, but the actual essence of Utah is essentially feels very, very tight now. And now the issue is now that the, the system is done and I can now situate it in what knowledge systems are, my hope is, is that I can now package it with appropriate framings for appropriate audiences so that they know how to enter it and begin the process of digesting it so that it's useful to them where they are, which by the way, is gonna require a number of different entry points depending on what the audience is. But as it sits now, I think it's getting to be a point that's ready. And that's where I am developmentally. It's like, oh, now I'm really looking to sync up with people, show them what this goddamn thing can do, and then have them actually help me market it in a particular ways in different places so that then those individuals that are in those places or whatever looping then can see, hey, yes, I may want something better. Oh my God, what this is. Hey, if you're there and this thing's here, I know how to get you to here and here and have that be a very reinforcing path that cultivates behavioral investment and justification so that you can grow and then use this and apply it in a way that's helpful to you. Do you have particular carrots built into it? Do you have like, um, yeah, how, yeah. How, do you, how do you sell it? How do you, how do you, you know, what's the economic equation of, of getting people to go through this? Sure, uh, I mean, there's, so now there's a, the, I mean, the, the, there's the analytic carrot, okay, that I've framed. Uh, so it actually, it says, hey, if you're an analytic type and think in terms of problems and problems to solve, the thing solves three core problems. OK, there's actually a problem of psychotherapy. I'm actually president of the Society for Psychotherapy Integration. Uh, so I can speak with authority uh, in terms of say, up, oh, there's a real problem with psychotherapy. There's the problem of psychology. And then there's what I call the enlightenment gap. OK, the enlightenment gap is that when science and the enlightenment philosophers like Kant came along, they built a new epistemological system. But it then came with two massive problems. OK. One is, I already talked, matter-mind relation. They never solved matter-mind-body problem more colloquial. We, we can just, everyone's got six style, hard problem of consciousness, all this, other, you know, no, nobody knows how to frame that. And there's also a core problem in relationship to the nature of scientific knowledge relative to social and subjective knowledge, okay? In terms of like, what is true about scientific knowledge and what is contextual? And you can see this in the modernist epistemological frame versus the postmodern critique of modernity. Okay, so modern versus postmodern, mind versus body, enlightenment gap is like we have a broken synthetic philosophy. Okay, so for the analytics out there, you're like, hey, that's my diagnosis, enlightenment gap, problem of psychology, problem of psychotherapy. You talk is by far the only systems in the fucking ballpark. And if you actually really are an egghead academic, okay, then boom. Okay, so now you can say, all right, here's an architecture and this is actually how you solve it. And you have to, if you're going to be, if you're really going to understand, if you're looking for intellectual understanding, then you have to devote and study and learn. Okay. And then there's a lot of other things that actually you can bite off of it. I developed the whole thing back here in terms of, so there are different points that you can pull off of it. And you can say, I'm just going to use this thing. Okay. So like the fourth one, the yellow circle is the influence matrix. Okay. Right in the center of the influence matrix is this black line. The influence matrix measures your, is a map of your heart. And what I mean by that is your relationship system. It's how you feel connected to other people. Okay. Uh, and what it, you have inside of you is you track at the core of your relational process. You track your social influence. This is how much you can instrumentally influence other people based on your interests. And you track your relational value. Okay. This is the extent to which you're known and valued by important others. All right. And you have a relationship system that's exquisitely attuned to tracking this RVSI process, okay? Relational value and social influence. When somebody comes to me clinically in a normal psychotherapeutic sense, an enormous amount of the pain is because they experience low and traumatic RVSI problems. I'm not valued, I have no social influence, okay? Well, 
a gem here that says actually what we should be doing relationally because what we're really tracking at our heart is the felt sense of relational value to the extent we're known in value, okay? Do you know what we do in our economic world? We basically maximize social influence, okay? In other words, we basically say, hey, how can we actually create an economic indicator of how much influence power you have, aka money bottom line, and how do we deploy monetary economic structures to get more influence out of people, all right? Well, from a policy perspective, what that essentially does is you just manipulate people based on social influence and you distance that from true relational value, you'll kill the heart soul. Okay. People will feel manipulated. They'll try to gather shit, but deep down inside, they'll feel really empty. So there's another nugget from a policy perspective in relationship to governance and economics issues is like, what mm -hmm. the fuck? We're actually cultivating a social influence Machiavellian structure when we actually are really attending to our felt sense of relational value. So you wonder why we got a mental health crisis mm. popping around? Well, there's an idea. And maybe we should build our systems where people are known mm. and valued. Mm. Okay. And the last thing I'll do is to like you pull the uh, last black, uh, uh, the black thing on the dot on the tree over there. And that's a mindfulness symbol. That's an eye looking down. Okay. Uh, and the last apple on the tree is an integrated approach to psychological mindfulness. Mm. Okay. And really what it does is it's part of a system that distills the problems that people have psychotherapeutically, that drive them to psychotherapy, okay? They're internalizing neurotic problems that make up about 80, 70 to 80% of what I treat, okay? And they're basically can be summarized as this, all right? People get in what are called triple negative neurotic loops, all right? What is that? Triple negative neurotic loops. Negative it sounds very happens. promising at face yeah. value. All right. Yeah, well, what get, happens like to that. people is that they get negative situations. Boom. Life bumps <laughs> them. Okay. You get a breakup. Your car, you know, shit happens. You look bad, etc. Other people screw you over, etc. Okay. You get conflict. All right. Shit that you don't want. Then you get a negative feeling set around that because that's actually what your emotion behavioral investment system is designed to do. Like that's bad. Try to compensate and avoid for that and send the signal that you just experienced pain, okay? And then orient to either anger, shame, guilt, loss, okay? That's what, they, that's what your primate system is designed to do. Then what happens is your person system comes along, puts those feelings and the situation in context and has a third negative reaction that says, fuck, I don't want these feelings and I don't like this situation and I'm gonna try to control shit. I'm gonna try to get my feelings out of there control this situation, control myself, blame myself, blame other. And the way in which you then second blame the feelings and the situation makes shit mm -hmm. worse. Mm -hmm. And then now all of a sudden you're more vulnerable, more defensive, more agitated, and more likely to have negative shit happen to you because you didn't cope effectively. So then, boom, you get more negative, more negative feelings, more negative anxiety mm -hmm. about the thing and you get a triple um, negative neurotic yeah, just just sorry okay. just to jump in greg just speaking of negative things i know mike mike's yep. got to leave us but i've got a fair quite a lot more ah, quite a lot more okay. questions for you so mike thanks for being here and uh yeah me and you greg will carry on perfect all right so, great to meet you greg it's been a pleasure i enjoyed it so one I mean, we can, we can continue on this, ne this, this, this negative route, but one big question I have, and perhaps this is a really ob perhaps this is a really obvious one, but it's what stops someone from drawing? So what you're looking at with your unified theory of knowledge in it's in that word unified is there is these separate bits, which people have drawn lines around behaviorism with Skinner, psychodynamic, mm -hmm. so Carl Rogers, sure. et cetera. People have drawn lines around them. And they've gone, that's over there. That's over there. That's over there. Perhaps it's perhaps it's blindingly obvious, but what is to stop someone coming along and drawing a line around unified uh, unified theory of, of psychology and saying that is just a theory? Right. Um, okay. So that's that's a certainly a good question. You then have to decide what you mean by a theory. Okay. Uh, and so um, the the unified theory of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's back up with the unified theory of knowledge. Okay. Um, it's, it, it is a philosophical mm -hmm. system um, and, and properly really a, a kind of philosophical system called a meta psychological system, which means it's specifically positioned between the base of philosophy and whatever we would call the branch of psychology and mind, soul, spirit uh, along those lines. And so that it lives in that particular kind of space. So if people were to interpret the word theory as like, oh, it's mm -hmm. just a theory, 
the semantic meaning of the word theory is not what's mm -hmm. meant here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so the first thing that it is, is it's a theory of knowledge, which would then back up and say, well, what do you mean? And it starts with a metaphysical picture. Okay. A metaphysical picture means that I'm going to be very clear about the concepts and categories that I am now going to deploy to let you make sense out of the mm -hmm. world. Okay. So it'd be like, it's just a theory that this is a conversation. Like, not really. I'm using the concept conversation to apply to the dialogue that you and I are having. To then say it's just a theory that it's a conversation misconstrues the word theory. It's actually a descriptive concept that has a particular nominological relation between events. And that's actually where I start. So it's a descriptive metaphysical system to begin mm -hmm. with. Then when you get into the, that's why it's learning like a language. Okay. All right. So it then organizes language in a particular kind of way. And then what it starts to do is it says it affords you the opportunity to apply the language of various facets and decide how intelligible the world appears to be as you learn mm -hmm. the language. Mm -hmm. So outside of that, I mean, if someone was to come along and say, well, you know, a conversation is just the theory and they start pulling everything apart and deconstructing, they would almost be leaning onto the side of sort of madness, right? That point where, well, if, if so, sort of well, saying, if, I mean, well, you're if you're going to disagree on what a conversation is, then you're leaning into a sort of a relativism, which is for all practical purposes, completely useless. Right. Totally. Now, all, I mean, to come along and uh, it is a kind of question, answer, justification to say, I don't think, that, you know, what does your theory really prove? Mm. Okay. We're going to know what that propositional network essentially refers to. And we're going to have to gain some reference. It doesn't refer to everything. And obviously, uh, if you simply want to be some sort of radical skeptic that nothing is intelligible under any circumstances, and I can always throw silly mm. questions at it, I'm, I'm not terribly interested in uh, wandering around mm. that world. If, if somebody wants to be like, okay, I'm going to be a, such a radical deconstructionist by the time this question lands in sound, I've already decided that nothing <laughs> makes sense. It's like, fine, you can go, you can go do that if you want. I'm actually interested in coherent, integrated intelligibility that affords the capacity for sense making across a wide variety of different mm -hmm. domains. So what would this look like in practice? Well, it depends on what you mean by practice. Well, uh, there's a ways in which. So, so as I uh, perhaps I've misunderstood, perhaps I've misunderstood little bits of it. As you're bringing in all these other, uh, you know, psychological li lineages of psychology, is this is this a, is this a you know once again use that word theory? But is this a theory that is intended for use uh, in, in a clinical setting, or is it a, a foundational thing to allow for you know different, shall we say, like blossoms of clinical settings? Right. It, it actually, so this is great. That's why I asked. Uh, and actually you can go foundational down into, it is about, it's a framework for living essentially in the back half of the 21st mm -hmm. century. What do you mean by what? Okay. So you're going to have to expand on that. Right. So the actual structure of it is, okay, is an organization of knowledge oriented towards mm -hmm. wisdom that would be placed in the collective of humanity, if it could be afforded the educational, socialized, attentional network that would then download itself in relationship to the human collective conscious and serve as an organizing, meaning-making, experiential system that would be ingrained in the knowledge system of humanity to organize its collective behavior in the back half of the 21st century. So, so that's the that's the ultimate we're not so, ready for it yet. That's another way of saying that. <laughs> so yep. I, I think I saw somewhere okay. that you see it is coming uh, in at around 2050. Right. That's at 20, 2050 starts the back half. I actually will be dying. So that's, a, you know, that's a, that's a, that'd be a, hopefully <laughs> in terms of living. Uh, but no, the, it's a, a, I'm now very convinced that we are talking about a paradigmatic grounding that was going to require generations, uh, one to two generations of understanding in order to um, deep dive into the ground of it and then afford the capacity of the ground of it to be then built in individuals that are socialized into it. You know, like people that are born post-2007, um, you know, in terms of, oh, are you a digital mm -hmm. native? Okay. Like, well, you're a digital native. Oh, you actually 
um, you you know you live for better or for worse you live in the iPod world and where 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 you know where text and TikTok and the internet and video is just a given. Okay, those of us that were born in 1970, okay, or that watch the whole thing and we're we don't live mm-hmm. in that world. There, there are foundational systems of understanding that we all have been socialized in, in the modern and postmodern context of our chaotic, fragmented mm-hmm. pluralism, okay, that are actually that make, if you got socialized them and you wander around with these um, systems of understanding, these ideological ideas and frameworks, and they use, they make, you know, partial sense, but now you're basically baked into a system of understanding. Like my parents would never, ever, ever, despite the fact that he's just saying my dad's a history professor, ever be able to understand what the fuck I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and the reason is because his set of understandings as a history professor about what the human condition is and what the mind is and how we understand the world, which is, you know, he's a mm-hmm. professor and a, and a very uh, good one. He's anchored to a set of conceptions about mind and matter and the way the world works and what physics is and all of this stuff. That, that those preconceptions would are would have to be completely unfrozen and melted and then reconstituted in a foundational way um, that would have that would be really really well, basically impossible that's why I decided over time it's actually this is this is a thing for the children mm-hmm. it's not for the parents uh, this is something that actually needs to be you need to be socialized into the harmonious system so you can actually not make all the baked in errors that are actually populating us currently right now which contributes massively to the chaotic I mean, fragment that's quality. an incredible theory which which i'm super interested in which means almost what you're talking about is almost the plasticity of consciousness right at a certain point it's like no you're, you're locked in you're locked in you 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 don't get the Ooh. next bit so i mean but do you does does your would yeah, your yeah the, the psyche gets would your the theory allow yeah, for the the remelting of the consciousness to then you know, allow the consciousness to to expand, so it doesn't become locked in as as sure. as we have been in generations. Well, I mean, you have to. Okay, so right, there are there's potentiality for melting and reconstituting. Mm. Okay, but there's also an enormous amount of inertia and and stasis and resistance. Okay, uh, so for example, like mm. clinically, okay, if if you, whether we have a thing called stage of mm. change. If somebody's pre-contemplative, that's a, okay, meaning that they're not even aware that the problem is around. Somebody's a drinker, for example, and is like, I'm not really a drinker. I have no problems. It's all fine. That's called pre-contemplative, mm-hmm. okay? And then you were to say to me, hey, how are you going to help this person with their alcoholism in a pre-contemplative okay. stage? And I'm, you know, unless you lock mm-hmm. them up. Mm-hmm. I mean, which I would, which was worse than the cure, you know, I mean, the cure is worse than the disease. You could block them up and then mm. cure them that way, perhaps. And then they would hate you and be a prisoner. Uh, so I'll let them drink. Uh, but the idea that I'm actually going to then help them when they decide that there's no problem and they don't understand what this issue is to melt that problem, to reconstitute it with no stage of change that's even contemplating this as an issue. then yeah, no, you're, you're totally done. It's very similar to my intersection with the problem of, of the theory and the institution. The institution is chugging along, uh, although now more than ever, people are like, I think there's real problems, mm-hmm. but the institution is chugging along, producing you know, studies and trying to get better and the best of the best people are embedded in that investment system and they've done their accomplishments. I don't wanna minimize it, but the collective is actually some is less than the, uh, the parts uh, and because of, the, uh, because of the proliferation problem. But those, those systems, if they're doing okay, they're not going to melt and reconstitute in that kind of state. So you have to you have to be in a particular state. Kids mm. <laughs> that are looking to suck up and core organize their system is a great state. People that are looking for new solutions. So now my theory, for example, is getting a lot more attention over the last two to three years than mm. it ever had. There are some reasons for this, um, but the main reason is. I booted myself. I mean, I'm still a professor, but I basically told everybody, listen, I'm done with you guys fucking at the academy. I'm going to be a shaman on a hill professor. I'm going to stop publishing. I'm going to do cartoons for my theory and go out and talk to the innovators in the Internet. OK, so I, I made that move because I decided the inertia of the institution, even though I'm a lifelong academic, was pointless. The system can't move. And then I find people that are in this meta modern or idea market space or whatever, the people that are on the edge. And they're starting to get together. And then what happens? You get Trump into Me Too, and then you get COVID in particular. And now you get a collective system that is actually, I believe, that the consciousness of the, of 
huge portions of individuals like, you know what? Our institutions, they seem outmoded, outdated. I am losing massive faith that they have the capacity to cultivate us in the necessary transition with the digital age and the environmental crises mm -hmm. and our mental health going insane. A lot of people are looking around going, uh, I don't know that we're well structured to manage whatever transition is happening. So we better be looking for new ideas. In other words, the consciousness of the collective societies, or at least many societies, I'm shifted from pre-contemplative to contemplative, mm -hmm. meaning that they're like, ah, we should start looking for new ideas. And now they start coming and they're like, okay, 20 years ago, I would have seen your ideas. Just, okay, that's just so far out there. What the fuck? Blah, blah, blah. Some, you say you're a crazy genius. You're really a quack. I don't even mm -hmm. pay any attention. Okay. Now it's like, actually, maybe we do need to take some risks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe we do need to think. And I'm seeing that collect completely. I mean, people are definitely starting to wake up and starting to look around and starting to be willing to take some risk or some out of the box stuff and look for new visions that may actually really afford us something. And I feel that. And I think that what, what, what comes after the contemplative stage. Well, you get then prep preparation uh, and then action. Uh, so you come and then basically you go, Hey, I think I have a problem. Okay. Yes. I'm agreeing that I have a problem. I'm about ready to do something about it. And now I then drop into taking definitive specific steps to try to make change, at least in the classic stage. So would you, stage would you say your sort of exit, exit from the academy was the preparation and the action to say, look, the problem is, the problem is you guys, I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I mean, I, I was certainly, I mean, I've always been, you know, I'm invested in this whole, you know, this thing and I'm trying to get everybody else to change. Uh, but, but there was a series of events that started to me to get pre-contemplative, like, I mean, before I was, yeah, pre-contemplative, I'm an academic, it's all going to come from mm. the academy, okay? And then certain things start to happen, and then you start to wonder, hey, is this really? And then I actually stepped off my director role and tried to do a few things, and that got me in sort of like, and I, it's much too, um, it'd be much too foresight for me to say I was really engaged in preparation. It was a series of events. I got in a huge fight with my program. Jordan Peterson was a big deal in relationship to sort of serving as a catalyst. Uh, there was a whole bunch of shit that happened, but it did cause me to reconsolidate my identity. And there was definitely stage of change stuff. It's like, when am I going to really stop identifying as a classic academic and basically be like, no, I'm a shaman on a hmm. hill. <laughs> so that, was a, that was a transformation. Um, and, and then consolidated around that identity, you know, probably two years hmm. ago. Or so. I've noticed you, you use a lot of uh, mythical and religious metaphor. I mean, with the tree, the garden, you're mentioning now that you're a shaman. Also this idea that of it has to be targeted at children, you know, be like children as unto God. I mean, I'm just, I'm just intrigued. Are you a religious man yourself or is, is, where does religion sit in this system as well? Totally. No. So, um, so that's a great question. Uh, so I get raised as a new atheist, uh, in terms of my, uh, particular structure. My dad has a Billy Graham conversion, uh, when he's in his, I think, you know, twenties or so early twenties. And then, and then the light goes out and he turns to history and we get raised with Dawkins and atheism and things like that. And so and I'm a hardcore behavioral scientist. Uh, so my, my home is atheism. Uh, that comes to mean to me uh, without a, the preface is a, without theism or the belief in a personal, knowable, relatable mm -hmm. God. Okay. Um, so uh, I, and I, and mm -hmm. I remain that. I remain an atheist in that sense. Okay. Um, I'm also an agnostic. All right. And I'm an atheist and an agnostic. All right. Which means that I'm I'm not a foundationalist. OK, if, or at least when it comes to the ontic reality, the ontic is whatever the universe fundamentally is. And do I have foundational, unassailable knowledge of what the fundamental essence of the universe is? My answer is mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. So I am agnostic about the fundamental ontic structure of mm -hmm. reality. OK, and then I'm a synthiest. OK. Um, a synthiest means believe, I believe in the concept of God right? and the potential for us to create a God-like um, image and imaginal mm -hmm. structure and what it would mean for us to effectively project and collectively believe in the concept of God, okay? So the concept of God makes no ontological and metaphysical claims about a personal God. It's, I'm agnostic at some level in the sense that, hey, through our projections, God only knows what's mirroring back on us, pun intended. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And then, so essentially, I'm an agnostic, atheistic, mm -hmm. synthiist. 
And basically what that means is I'm agn agnostic about foundational ontic reality. Maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's energy. I mean, I will take then science as the most generalizable transcendent claims, and I call it the energy information implicate order. Okay, we talk about what that is, but anyway, then uh, I all of the personal gods where people are like, oh, my relationship break up and my God cares about me. It's like, I'm, I'm fine for you to have that relation. Uh, if we're going to talk about objective reality claims, then that's um, skeptical and I don't have that. Uh, and then, but at the same time, I really believe that the concept of God, a Paul Tillich kind of notion of an embrace of an ultimate concern, uh, a frame of reference of an ultimate endpoint. In fact, uh, although it's not in this depiction, uh, there's a thing inside that emerges over the garden called the elephant sun mm -hmm. god, okay, as an iconic representation. And the elephant is of the blind men and the elephant. It's also an old Hindu representation of a god mm -hmm. of light, okay, that we could see from a wide variety of different perspectives. And it is the old, it symbolizes an iconic representation of an integrated pluralistic ultimate concern of value that would then create a liminal space of what the good is, meaning an imaginal possible space of what we project our ideals to be on and then try to organize our soul and spirit in relationship to. So my soul is my unique way of being in the world. I have a transcendent spirit and the iconic representation of the elephant sun god is my projection of what that ideal would be. And then I use that as a sage-like you know, frame. In other words, I put my imaginal sage to look down on me, and then I place myself in wise relation to an imaginal sage that operates underneath the ideal. And then through that, I can then organize my soul mm -hmm. and spirit. Yeah. And I believe that the human constitution, the psychic constitution, really is remarkably, surprisingly, amazingly well organized to be organized mm -hmm. that way. So almost you could view you could view everything you're working on as a as a form of atheistic theology, targeted at yes. the conceptions of the things that you're atheistic towards, but utilizing those conceptions uh, for for a good, but a different good which isn't tethered to a monotheistic god. It's a religion that's not a religion <laughs> for the back half of the 21st century. I mean, I. No offense to you, I can see why academics would uh, shy away from me. I mean, it, that's one hell of a vision. So where, where? <laughs> I told you, man, all of a sudden, I'm stoned in 1997. You know, I was like, what the, I told you, I got one. So what do you, what do you? I mean, I'm really interested. What do you see the immediate future being for it? Is it making, is it making big strides at the moment? I mean, I'm very happy with the strides I make, and I'm connecting with a bunch of seers in, in interesting spaces uh, in a wide variety of different. There's a whole thing called the liminal web uh, that I'm involved in, and the, and the you talk represents a particular thread. And there are all there are a wide variety of different I would call them a community of seers that are emerging that are concerned about the current state of the world and have developed a, a whole bunch of different possible angles on the kinds of ways in which we might consciously evolve. Um, and so I've now found my people in this regard. So there's a whole uh, the short uh, one, if you have one word to put on, it's called meta modern. Mm -hmm. At least that's the word I prefer. It's the thing that comes after mm -hmm. postmodern. So there's a whole collective sensibility of people that are wandering around with the thing that comes after postmodernism. It, it synthesizes modernity and postmodernity. So modernity says, oh, there's these truth claims and rationality, and that's all good. And then postmodernity says, that's a bunch of white male patriarchy, and that created an oppression of mm -hmm. indigenous and marginalized peoples. And then the meta modern says, of course, both those things are true. And then there's a thesis and an antithesis and then an effective synthesis in proper relation. And then it's achieving that synthetic sen sensibility um, is one way of framing the community I found. Uh, the unified theory of knowledge is totally a meta-modern sensibility. I didn't have a word mm -hmm. at the time. Um, so I'm connecting with a subset of individuals and making connections. Uh, and then I see this, want to show that the unified theory is like this Rosetta Stone that can take these very cool future visions um, translate them and tie them together so it serves a particular golden thread in this tapestry weave of this emerging culture. Uh, so my job right now is to consolidate the vision and connect it to the seers that are emerging. And then also what I'm doing is I'm starting to really connect with the people that have pragmatic mm -hmm. concerns, okay? 
the people that are much more grounded in the here and now and want to say, well, how do you have all those apples on that tree? I want to bite off a few of them and make use out of it. Jesus, it looks like it's really brilliant. Can you help me? And I'm like, okay, I'll work with you because you will be able to take that and translate it to your group. And then if I get a lot of people that I'm working with that are doing the translation process and they can, I can learn from how to do that, then that gets to what I was saying earlier about these different zones of proximal development for different audiences that I can create courses or systematic processes by which people can then learn how to digest. So I'm connecting with the seers on the one hand and beginning the process of identifying audiences that foster the socialization into it. Uh, and I'll be doing that for the next five, mm -hmm. seven years mm -hmm. or so. I so where, where can uh, potential seers or people who are interested in, in this work find it? Um, well, I, certainly the unified theory of knowledge org is the home page for it. Uh, the, at the end, there is a the last is a listserv theory of knowledge society I founded. Um, and uh, I have a, I'm going to shift this over to a newsletter soon, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, there are about 200 people that are part of the theory of knowledge list. Um, if you suit me a note and I dialogue with you, uh, I invite you to the theory of knowledge. That's, that's what it requires to get on the list and be a society member. Uh, then at the least you can start to dialogue with the community and stay in touch. I can also send my Twitter handle. Uh, if you just want to follow things like, you know, when I'm on podcasts and uh, I do a unified, a you talking with Greg podcast every week um, where I bring people on and dialogue. Of course, that's you talking play off the you know, uh, I do a lot of pun that way in relationship to meta language concepts. Um, so, uh, and I give out freely my uh, email. I have an endless numbers of conversations, hundreds of emails a day that I keep try to try to keep track of. I happy to dialogue with people out there. Wow. wow. I, uh, yeah, I think this is a great place to finish up. We've covered the, we've covered the theory. Everyone knows where to find it. And sincerely, Greg, I, I sincerely wish you the best because uh, you know, I've met so many people over the past few years um, who have these under under undervalued um, undervalued theories, under the undervalued things which they're truly passionate about. Which, if they could just get the attention, right? So, I sincerely wish you the best. Hey, man, I really appreciate the opportunity. the The sound of what you guys are doing in terms of the kind of collective leveraging of economic attention in this digital age, those are exactly the kinds of necessary mechanisms that will be, you know, the leveraging systems that these ideas can then be connected with. And it is a combination of those that will move us uh, in the right direction. So I have a huge amount of appreciation for what you guys are doing here. I really Thanks very much. Thank you. All right.